it's your girl Carolise. Welcome back to my channel. Thank you for being here. This is the place where you learn about business analysis, where you get practical examples, where I can share with you my experience, and so I can help you to start your career or grow your career as a business analyst. In today's video, we're going to be talking about some of those difficult questions that you have been getting in your interviews. So I did a video before this that you can see right here where I explained some answers to some very difficult questions. And since then, I've been getting some other questions from you guys. You've left comments on my YouTube videos. You've sent me emails. You've reached out to me and you've given me some examples of what you're being asked in these interviews. So I'm going to go through some of those comments and I'm going to answer for you some of those very difficult questions they've been asking y'all. And I'm going to share with you how you should answer them so that you can be prepared for your next business analyst job and land that job. I am rooting for you, okay? I'm going to help you. I got you. I got you. Okay? So without further ado, let's get started. All right, so I'm going to be looking at a comment that was left on my video about the secret to nailing your business analyst interview. And this is a comment from Amposa Benjamin. I hope I'm pronouncing it right. And this person says, I was asked if I had a product that was doing so well in some geographical areas, but was flunking in one geographical area, what are the steps I would take to find the issue? Mm -hmm. That is definitely one of those things you'd have to think about. If somebody threw that at you in an interview, <laughs> what would you do? <laughs> Honestly, I mean, these interviewers are not playing. They are coming up with all kinds of stuff. So the question is, if a product is doing well in one geographical area, but is not doing well in another geographical area, what steps would you take to find out the issue? So first we have to figure out what does doing well mean? What is the success criteria? What's the metric that we're using to measure doing well? Now for most companies, a product that's making the sales and the sales numbers are high is a product that's doing well. But I don't know how they're comparing these two geographical areas. Are you saying that within this area, we were comparing um, how much it did last year versus what it's doing this year or just across its competitors it's doing well versus not right so it, it's also important to know what is the how are they comparing this but let's take for example that we say it's just making more sales the volume of it is higher in one geographical area than the other if that's the case then we need to look at examine more data around what is happening in these different geographical areas so in one case for example is it that there was a spike because let's say you're selling beers and you are in germany and it's october <laughs> you're doing oktoberfest then your beers is going to go up much higher in germany than it is in england so for example right what is it what's the product what is happening in that geographical area that's caught maybe causing the spike or the decline in the sales and also is there any changes that we made have we made any changes to the product recently? Did we um, maybe change some of the features? Have we done any kind of study to make sure that this is not a, a, a change that has caused our customers to no longer feel identified with the product and no longer want to purchase it? So these are some of the things I would look into if I see there's a geographical change. And also, when you think of geography, you always think of languages, you think of cultures. Is there something about the culture that could be causing that product not to do well? I'll give you a quick example. The Toyota brand, they made a car called Nova, N-O-V-A, Nova. So it did well in parts of different parts of the world. Is your car up to it? We can tell you about our Chevrolet Nova. Last year, Motor Service and Service Station Management Magazine surveyed independent mechanics, and Nova was voted the car with the least mechanical problems. Chevrolet wants your new Nova to be the best car you ever owned. Chevrolet, do you But in the Spanish-speaking speaking world, it did not do well because the car named Nova in Spanish means does not go. So why would you buy a car that is telling you it's not going to work? So in Spanish-speaking countries, that car, that car brand didn't do well. So just an example of how cultures can make a difference in the product and also making sure that you're not 
being culturally inappropriate with the product and the type of product it is, okay? So a quick note right here. Snopes, the fact-checking organization, says that that story about the Chevrolet Nova not doing well in Spanish-speaking countries is false. But Snopes also says that drinking cola isn't harmful. So <laughs> it depends on who you want to believe. I think it's still a good story to tell, a good example to show. And I uh, said, so go ahead and use that example for the purposes of this answer. Now, back to the content. You know, I recorded the entire answer for this video and it wasn't recorded. Just shut me. No! So here we go. The type of product could cause it to do better in some geographical areas than others. So if it's, for example, a product that's very good for the summer, like ice cream, sunscreen, flip-flops, those will sell well in tropical areas or will sell well in the tropical months. But you can't sell flip-flop, for example, in Alaska because <laughs> in the colder months, it's not gonna, it's not gonna be sold as much. And so you need to compare to see, was this product always doing well? Or did something happen to cause a product to suddenly not be doing well in certain geographical areas? So for example, is it a new product that you're just launching and you are projecting it to do well, but now that you've really launched it, you realize it's not doing as well? That would also factor into understanding what the issue is. Some products do well in some regions and others. So it depends on the product and the region, and maybe there's something about the culture that would cause that product to do better in one region than the other. For example, um, sometimes your marketing. Have you been changing up your marketing style? Are you approaching a different audience? So for example, in the US, we just had this whole saga with Bud Light where some people were very offended by the type of marketing that Bud Light had. And so the sales dropped tremendously after that marketing campaign. Same with Balenciaga, the types of marketing can affect the perception of the product for sure and may cause the product not to do so well. So maybe in the US, Balenciaga is all the way down. In other parts of the world, maybe not so much. I don't know. Other things could be also, are there changes in the product? Did we change the way it is? Did we change the taste? If it's like a food item, did we change the formula? Did we change the manufacturing? Did we change the price? What have we changed that may account for this drop? So for example, with Twitter, as you know right now, Twitter CEO has now decided to remove the blue check mark and you have to pay for it. So maybe for some people, $8 a month is no problem. But for other people in different parts of the, the world, $8 US per month might be a bigger, bigger, you know, cost. So it could be that people might just not be using the tool anymore because they just don't want to do it. I don't know if that's true. But they, there could be changes in the pricing that affects regions more harshly than others. And so they may just go to the competitor. So all of these are factors I would look into to try to figure out what is the issue. And in general, it would be based on product, based on the region, based on culture, and based on any changes that we have made and also our marketing. So again, this is a long answer, right? You don't have all this time in the interview. So I'm just telling you what I would be thinking about so you can have an idea of how to think through it. But I don't know if they'll give you so much time in the interview to go through all that. So what I would do in a concise way is the way I would answer this concisely, unless they ask me for more follow-up questions and I would have a chance to expound more, but I would try to be as concise as possible when I'm answering, but still give them details. I would say something like this. The first thing I would want to find out is what is the metric you're using to measure success? So what does doing so well mean? What factors are you using to do that comparison? And the other thing I'd look at is, are you comparing across the years? Have the product always done well in these regions? Or are you comparing across competitors to see are you doing well compared to the competitor or are you comparing against time? So those are some of the things I would look at to see what is the comparison that you're doing to come up to figure out that it's not doing well in these different geographical areas. I'd also want to look at the culture. Maybe it's a cultural component because of the geography that maybe one thing does well in one culture than the other thing. I'd also look at um, if there's any seasonal thing going on. So if your product is more attractive in a particular season, is it because the seasons are changing and that's why you have this? Is it a new product? So maybe you projected what you thought would be the sales and when you actually put it out there, you realize 
is not doing so well in this area versus the other. So those are some of the considerations I would look into to try to find out what the issue is. There you have it. So something like that. And if they want more, you can follow up with more. Okay. That's all to answer that question. Now the other question, the question goes on. So <laughs> this person really gave me a lot to answer. The other part of the question was, imagine you have to present some ideas to the stakeholders in different countries and you will need their opinion on which ones to pick moving forward. So I don't think the question is worded right, but the gist of what she's asking is, if you have to talk to multiple stakeholders in different countries, and you need them to make a decision on multiple options. So they need to choose one of those options. How would you do it, right? So if they throw that question at you, what would you do? <laughs> well, the first thing is, it shouldn't matter that they're in different countries because stakeholders are, um, Basically, they have the best interest in what it is that you're doing, the best interest in the product, and you should be talking to stakeholders to understand what their expectations are. So if it depends on the country, then you'd know that. But really, having a conversation with stakeholders right now in a virtual world, you can always do a Zoom meeting. Everybody can join. The geographical separation doesn't typically make a big difference. Only thing it would make a difference in is the requirements that you're going to gather from them. So if you need their opinion on different items, then what I would do as a business analyst is I would make sure to research very well what are these items, make sure I have a clear picture of what the pros and the cons of each decision would be and each option would be to make sure that when these stakeholders come to the table and they have questions about the different options, I can be able to answer them or I have people in the room who has the information to give them because different time zones and different countries, you may not be able to pull a meeting with these people together very often. So you don't want to meet with them and then have to re-meet to, to go back over things. So you wanna make sure you facilitate the meeting properly. You have the right people in the room. You choose a time slot that would be appropriate for each of them in the different countries that they are in so they can all be there. Hopefully you can find some time that is at a decent hour that overlaps in everybody's time zone. And so you go into the meeting with pros and cons for each option. And then you also have your own recommendation that you'd like to suggest, but you'll take their individual feedback. You'll ask probing questions and then you'll be able to help guide them towards the best choice. That is how I would help stakeholders to help them make a decision on, on different options. Right? So that's just the gist. That is the gist of how you would answer a question like this, right? They mention that's different countries because they want you to be aware of maybe things like time zones and language barriers and all these different things. And it is your job to facilitate the meeting, but you're not a miracle worker, right? They all have to speak the same language or have some way to understand each other. And your job would be to clarify and to ask probing questions and to make sure that we all walk away from this meeting, accomplishing something, understanding what needs to be done and having a clear picture of the road ahead, right? So that's, that's the gist of having these stakeholder um, discussions. And because it's multiple stakeholders, it would generally be like a workshop setting or a, a group meeting setting, right? It wouldn't be a one-on-one -on -one interview because it's a group of stakeholders. Okay, the next question. Given that you have a user story that does not have a timeline or is not urgent, because of that, all the other requirements that have urgency or timelines keep pushing the one without timeline down the backlog. Hmm. What would I do to build the story with no timeline? <laughs> These are indeed some difficult questions. They are not playing with y'all. They are not playing, okay? So you gotta get your ducks in a row for these interviews, okay? So, <laughs> let me help you, all right? So the first thing is, I want you to understand what they're asking here because it's something that if you're not working in the field, it might, it might go over your head a little bit. What they're saying is that you have stories that is in the backlog. Now, typically you only have stories in the backlog if you intend to build it. So you intend to build, let's say, a payment processing system, but it's not urgent because they can pay with PayPal right now, right? So you just have PayPal for now, but you want to, you want to be able to eventually integrate to 
some payment processor like Stripe or something, and so you can take credit cards or whatever, right? So that's a store you have in your backlog. Or it is that you want to be able to send um, updates via SMS, and you have that store in your backlog, but right now they get an email and it's okay. So you may have things in your backlog which are enhancements to improve your product, to delight your customers, but they're not urgent because you can do something else in the minute while you're waiting to get that feature out, right? So what they're saying is urgent things keep popping up. So for example, the website is down or you're getting a 404 error or um, the payment processor is not connecting or whatever. These things are urgent because that's going to affect how you make money. So because they're urgent, they take priority. And so what happens is if you constantly have these urgent things coming in, then the thing that you need to build to really move the product forward gets being pushed lower and lower. And you have a limited amount of resources, limited amount of time, limited amount of people. And so they have to focus on the most urgent thing first. And it just happens to be one urgent thing after the next. So what they're asking is, how would you as a business analyst help to build the story that is not as urgent? But it is a trick question, see? Because it is not your job to determine what they build. It is the job of the product owner to prioritize the backlog. So the product owner is managing the roadmap and the product owner needs to determine which of these user stories do we focus on and which of these user stories should we be working on at which point. So if you've written your job is to make sure the user store is in the definition of ready. So your job is to make sure that it has all the acceptance criteria. It has the attachment of the different design files. It has the Excel, the data mapping or whatever you need for the story to be complete, that it, it is there. You have done your elicitation. You have talked to the stakeholders. You understand the problem. This is the solution that the team has agreed to. It's documented properly. That is it. You're not supposed to be there trying to say, well, we need to do this first and do this next. And this is our job. That is the product owner's job or the project manager. Now, if you're in a dual role where you're playing the proxy product owner, then it would become your job to prioritize. But in most organizations, you have a separate role for a product owner than you have for a business analyst. So in the case of what would I do to build the story with no timeline, it would be talking to the product owner to say this story has been pushed down and down in the backlog for the last couple of sprints and I want to confirm if we're ever going to get to it, right? So typically, you should be managing your stories in sprints if you're doing Scrum. If you're doing Kanban, then you have a different way to do it. But if you're doing Agile Scrum, you would have planned the entire sprint ahead of the sprint. So if you're planning to do the story, it would have been in the sprint. And hopefully you wouldn't have stories coming in suddenly and just bumping things out and things get pushed in and it's a whole chaos. That would not be a good way to be managing your scrum. So hopefully you're planning for the sprint and you're trying to stick to what you've planned and stick to what you've committed to. If you find that there's a lot of disruption in the sprint and there's constantly new urgent things coming in, it's a very good indication that you're not doing good development because you shouldn't have things breaking so often that they have to be emergency fixed and this is urgent and has to be done right now, right? Or if it's a timeline thing, then you should be working along that timeline. If you say this is what you're going to deliver for the next three months, then that's what you should be delivering the next three months. So everything should have a timeline. The user story itself should be on a roadmap somewhere because you don't create user stories just to create user stories. You create user stories because you plan to build it. And so if it's in the backlog, that means that you had planned to build it. So it should have a timeline. So those are things that the product owner would be responsible for. So the answer to the, the short answer to this question would be that you would communicate with your product owner to make sure they can prioritize the story that you're working on. And hopefully it will be a part of a sprint and committed in the sprint so that we don't have disruptions pushing it in and out. So uh, hopefully they will be managing the sprint in such a way that the stories that we're going to build would be prioritized in the sprint. And if we find that there's constant disruption with new things coming in because they're more urgent, then maybe I would suggest that we have a separate 
board or a separate backlog that would manage the more urgent things in this backlog. And then we have another backlog for the more um, the things that are taking longer, who are not as urgent, but very important. And so we could focus the attention of the team to work through the urgent things first, and then they'll be able to work on the other things after. But those would be suggestions I would make to the product owner, and then they could structure how they'd want it to work from then on. My responsibility mainly would be to make sure that the user store itself has the right acceptance criteria and is in a definition of ready, so that when they pick it up, it is ready to be built. That's it. That's the answer. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Last question. So the last part of this question, which is quite a bit, but I'm so grateful for her for leaving this question. I hope it's a her. I'm Ponsa. Could be a her. Could be a he. I'm not sure. Is I find out in the company, even with developers and operators, internal end users that they don't understand one of the product what will i do to ensure they understand yes so the question is that the people in the organization even the supposed subject matter experts the developers themselves the end users they just don't understand the product how will you as a business analyst help them to understand well, first of all, it's really a bad sign if developers don't understand the product and users don't understand the product, operators don't understand the product. I mean, it means that we have not done a good job of making sure the product actually is solving a real problem because if it was solving a real problem, they would understand it. But in the event that we may be something new, it may be something integrated, maybe there are pieces of it that they understand other pieces that they don't, they don't see how it all comes together then your job as a business analyst is to help to facilitate that understanding. So some of the ways that you can do that is for the internal staff, such as your developers and your uh, operators, you would have workshops with them to walk through the product, to show what it does and why it does it, the business case it's applying to, and just basically have a hands-on session so they themselves can get in the product and feel it for themselves. And that way they remember it. Also, you could work with your um, your technical writer if you have one, so they could write documentation around the product, such as help files, release notes, things that would help the team to have some kind of reference for them to understand what the product is intended to do. And also, if you have a marketing team, you could also help with the marketing information so that they could be updated as well on the websites, etc. For the end users, you'd work with the marketing team so they could start you know, market to them and give them information, maybe email newsletters about the product. You could also help wherever you can find a place to put maybe hover over text to explain what these different fields might mean. Maybe you suggest doing that from the product owner, they could build that in. You could also have documentation available online so even end, end users can go find the documentation. Um, and also a little walkthrough. So if it's possible to put a walkthrough in the product so they can get a tour basically of the product as they go into it to help them to understand what it's supposed to be doing, then that might be helpful as well. So there are different tools that you can use depending on whether it's an internal customer or end user to help them to get up to speed and to understand how to use the product. And as a business analyst, that is something that you'd be willing and able to do, right? Yes. So there you have it. There you have it, y'all. That was the video explaining to you how to answer these very difficult business analyst questions that you guys are getting in your interviews. I hope this video was helpful for you. I hope that you're able to learn and to adapt so that when you get your question, you have the skills to be able to apply some of what we shared in this video. Please go check out my website, carolise.com where I have some examples of interview questions that you can use to practice, where I share with you a whole training free of how to prepare for the interview and also check out the playlist that I have on business analyst interview prep. All right, so thank you guys for staying with me to the end and I will see y'all next time. Bye-bye.